Greetings. I hope and trust I find you well. We have um, made uh, some progress. We are now moving on to contract law. And um, as we go into contract law, we are building on the preceding videos that we have covered on um, number one, what is business? Number two, what is law? And uh, we'll be building from some of those concepts and uh, adding them onto this uh, tutorial as we go on. What are some of these issues that we are looking at today? Uh, to begin with, when we look at a contract, you'll notice that we say the constitution has um, a mandate that it imposes upon the court to defend the freedoms. And what are these freedoms? Not just independence, the freedom to contract. And in this freedom to contract, what we are saying is people can come together as equal parties we did make reference to um, a set where we had um, the supplier, we had the entity, and we had individuals come together. And whenever they came together as uh, uh, parties, they would come into a contractual agreement. In that contractual agreement, we said there has to be a meeting of the mind. And this meeting of the mind, we also did make reference to it. We said... Uh, uh, a business activity basically is meeting their needs and um, demand for goods and services. And a satisfactory demand, a satisfactory meeting of this demand of these goods and services will then be the scope of where the contract operates from. And secondly, it being the scope from where the contract operates, we also did make mention of the fact that when the parties agree to the terms, what are the goods that they are dealing with in and who are the parties? Do they come within the scope of being uh, parties under COBIA 2019 or under CPA 2019 or under LRA 2006? So when they all come together, what we're looking at is, is there an agreement? Is there a meeting of the minds? This meeting of the minds, is what is called the consensus ad idem. Consensus ad idem, which means there must be consent. The parties must have agreed. And this brings us to Amos chapter 3, the verse is 3. The Bible says, can two walk together except they are agreed? Can two walk together except they be agreed? If we're to phrase this in the context of... Um, contract language. The question would be, can two walk together if there is no consensus ad idem? There must be a meeting of the minds for people to walk together figuratively. So as we pray, we need to appreciate that we need to walk together with the Lord. We need to come into a relationship. We need to come to a common understanding on what is going to happen. The songwriter says, I have a friend so precious, so very dear to me. He loves me with such tender love. And he loves so faithfully. And what do I do with this friend of mine? We walk together. We talk together. We work together. I tell him all my heart's desires. Christ says, I wish to be in an agreement with you. I need for us to have a consensus ad idem. Let us pray for this consensus ad idem and say, Lord, may you lead us into an agreement of the mind so that we can walk together like Enoch who walked with the Lord. Let us take time to pray. Kind and gracious Father in the heavens above, dear Lord, we are going into agreements, a study of the contracts. We pray, dear Father, that above all, we can come into a contractual relationship with you, a relationship that transcends this life and leads us into an eternity. We wish to walk with you as Enoch of old. O oh, Master, allow us to walk with you today. This has been our prayer of faith. In Jesus' name we pray and ask, Amen. As we go into contract uh, law, we're going to take um, a principles approach as we study it. And there are certain theories that um, uh, stick out as far as contracts are concerned. We have the will theory. Um, I think uh, the sanctity of contract theory. We have the... Um, Freedom of contract theory. So these are some of the theories that we're going to be looking at. 
And as far as the, the will theory is concerned, it basically means the parties come into the contract as willing participants. They come in as willing participants. And for them to be willing participants, it simply means they have consented to be in the contract. They have not been coerced. They have not been forced in any way. So because of that willingness to be in the contract, the contract is believed, is assumed to be in existence. So when a, a contract is in existence, um, the other word that you're going to find that can be used for existence is subsist. Usually you're going to find uh, this in most of the law uh, documents. They say it subsists. It simply means it exists. So where a contract is in existence, we assume that there has been no um, tempering with the consent and the parties have agreed to be in this contract and they are willing to be in there. So when there is no free will, where the contract has been procured through force, through threats, now we say this contract will not exist. And the legal term for this, we say it is void ab in issue. Void ab in issue. So um, for this, uh, how, how did I get this into my mind? I always try to give you this. Void is clear, you know, like in, in your accounting, you draw two lines along the, um, the page and you write void uh, or even have a stem that voids. Void is clear. Write ab. It's just A, B, initio, I, N, I, T, I, O. So how did I get this uh, into my mind? I said, it is void and absent initially. So if, if you take it from English back into Latin, it becomes easier to understand. I do not know whether this is correct or not, but it helps you understand. So it is void and absent initially. So this already tells you something. If it is void and absent initially, it simply means it does not exist. So these are contracts that would become nullified from the get-go. So that's what means void up initial. That's what void up initial means in essence. And then the other theory we're going to look at, that's theory number two, is on sanctity of contract theory. The sanctity of contract theory basically assumes that when people go into contractual relations, it is assumed that should there be a fallout under certain conditions, they can seek enforcement of the contract, specific enforcement of the contract. And what is this specific enforcement? They can approach the courts and have the courts decide on what should happen as far as the contractual relationship is concerned. So the court is going to mandate and say, make sure you do right by this contract. So the contract will be formed by the way the rights and obligations. And we did mention this and we said um, at the end of the previous video, the law creates certain rights, just like section 134 creates certain uh, rights as far as the subordinate legislation is concerned. So the law also gives parties the rights to enter into contracts. And when they enter into contracts, they create both rights and obligations. So where these rights and obligations have been created, what are then the guarantees that are there, that the obligations are going to be carried out? That is where the sanctity of theory, I mean, sanctity of contract theory comes in. Now, let's uh, have um, an example. Someone walks into a shop, right, and uh, purchases um, a dining room set, let's say, a dining room set, eight piece, and uh, this lady is driving her Mac, Mercedes Benz. And obviously, a, a Mac is not going to fit into, um, I mean, a, a dining room set, an eight-sitter is not going to fit into a Mac. Now, when she now leaves this place, she has paid for the property in full. She drives back home to go and wait for the supplier. I mean, the, 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 the shop owner to deliver these goods. So the confidence of paying a thousand US dollars plus and driving off to go and wait at home is derived from contract sanctity, sanctity of contract. 
the purchaser, the customer, operates on the presumption, on the assumption, that if the shop owner does not deliver, does not provide the goods as paid for, she is going to seek redress through the courts. That is what is the bedrock of all these financial transactions. Sanctity of contract. That's where you're going to find that large sums of money are paid out because people know that when the job is not done, they are going to seek enforcement and redress through the courts. This uh, reminds me of uh, the solar project that, that did the news for some time in Zimbabwe. Um, I think it was um, Wignal Chivayo's uh, company that was paid large sums of money. And uh, there was something irregular about the tendering process. That matter was referred to the courts. And the courts um, gave a directive on what was supposed to be done. That is sanctity of contract. The courts are going to interfere and seek to ensure that the courts, um, I mean, the contract is enforced. So they, 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 this is also known as legal certainty. They, there is a certainty that goes into the process that is assured and guaranteed by the judiciary and by the legal system. The third theory we're going to look at is freedom of contract. What is freedom of contract, basically? Freedom to enter into contracts. It's just like uh, your will theory. But here's the difference now. This one is an exclusive freedom. I remember we did discuss the personal rights and the real rights. It almost works like a real right. The freedom theory simply says we have gone into this contract freely. So nobody else should come in. We are free to regulate, to self-regulate ourselves. Now, the freedom of contract theory um, is limited to some extent. You're going to find that the government would not necessarily allow us to, to say, uh, hands off, government, stay out. This is just our business. We are all, we are all good. We're in a good space. Uh, government will not really allow us to do that. So it, it, it tends to infringe into the freedom of contract theory. And how does it do so? It counter-regulates these contractual relations. So how does it counter-regulate these contractual relations? This is where now you're going to be looking at your CPA. What is CPA doing? It basically regulates the relationship between the supplier and the consumer. What is the LRA, the Celebrity Relations Act, doing? It's regulating relations between the employer and the employee. So this freedom of contract is not really an exclusive kind of a relationship. Government comes in as the third wheel in this um, buy relationship. It says, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. true, 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 your, your relating is equals, but the, the concept of being in a contractual relationship as equals is fiction. It's not real. It's fiction. Maybe in the sense of marriage, that's where you would say you're equal parties, but I don't know whether you all agree that in a marriage we're equal parties. We may be equal in the sense of um, ideally. In a contract, you are equal ideally, but there's someone who gets more out of the contract than the other. In a marriage, there's some who benefit more from the marriage than the other. So let us go in and look at these um, theories and um, try and ventilate some more on number one, the will theory, number two, the sanctity of contract, and number three, the freedom of contract. And what we want to look at is... Um, Basically, on will theory, the prerequisites for contract formation. There are four basic conditions that should be met in order for a contract to be uh, deemed to have come into existence. And these three would lead us to the fourth, which we named as the consensus ad idem. At number one, we have legal capacity. The parties that go into contracts they must be of a certain standing. I did refer to this in our initial videos. And they must be of a certain standing before the courts. They can be um, of a certain uh, status biologically, uh, mentally, medically, um, you know, all these things. Now, let us look at uh, legal capacity. Now, what are those legal issues that would arise? And then at number two, we're going to look at the intention to be legally bound. So people would not um, give themselves over jurisdictionally. Remember, we say, to whom do, does the law apply? 
we can set a jurisdiction and say, as far as our contract is concerned, should we have a fallout, it is going to be decided in those courts, in those places, provided we're not going to be choosing the, the, um, the constitutional court. <laughs> so on, on, on those issues of uh, jurisdiction, we can assign jurisdiction in terms of the magistrate's court, in terms of the labor um, officers, in terms of um, alternative dispute resolution, that is your arbitrations and stuff like that. You can uh, decide on those. And then at number three, we'll look at contract terms. And lastly, consensus ad idem. All these lead us into consensus ad idem. Now let's look at uh, legal capacity. So where legal capacity is um, absent, there is no legal capacity. What does this mean? It means these people cannot give consent. So when we looked at the free will theory, if we could rephrase it, we we'll simply say this is choice with consent. So the person may have chosen to do so, but they do not have capacity to consent. So when we take away the capacity to consent, the contract falls away. At what point does it fall away? Void ab initio. It becomes void and absent initially. So what this simply means is it does not come into effect. What are some of those scenarios where it would not come into effect? And the first scenario would be where one of the parties is a minor or even both parties are minors. A minor is someone who's below the majority age. The majority age being 18 years. So in this context where anyone is below 18 years, they ordinarily would not have the power to uh, enter into valid contracts. Now, this 18-year uh, um, restriction or threshold does not always hold true. There are exceptions that would apply. What are some of these exceptions that would apply? A contract may be entered into with a minor, provided that the minor is assisted by a major. A major simply means it's somebody who's beyond the majority age. So a, a major is a guardian, a sponsor, a parent, you know, they, they, they are the ones who are going to come in and sign for the minor. So the contract is with the minor, even though it has been countersigned by the major. So in that kind of a setup, the contract is going to become valid. And should the minor seek to enforce the contract, they do so through the major. They're not going to do so on their own. So the major also, also sort of assumes agency. They do everything on behalf of the minor. So what the, mi the, the, in the major would do is to enforce the wishes and will of the minor. At number two, we will have a minor who is between 14 and 18. However, this minor who is between 14 and 18 can enter into a valid contract provided there are certain conditions that are met. What are some of these conditions? The minor must be emancipated. To be emancipated, it simply means you are uh, independent to some extent. You could be living on your own or taking care of your upkeep, bills, and things like that. That is what emancipation speaks to. So if the minor is below 18, but there is substantial evidence that the minor is emancipated, taking care of their business, such a minor can enter into valid contracts. And at number three, should you have a minor who is... Um, a minor by age that is less than 18, but between 16 and 18 and married, lawfully married. So this particular minor can enter into a valid contract because uh, a, a woman who is below 18, should I call them women or children? All right. A woman who's below 18 at 16 years particularly can go into a marriage. So at 16, someone can get married provided that um, a parent consents. But even though we are not looking at um, marriage law, I think a 16-year-old is just to push it too far. 16-year-old, that's uh, like what? Lower six? Form four? You know? Sh sh should you be saying that is wife material? Form four? Let me pause a bit. Form four? Ah, come on. Let's be serious. Anyway, it's, uh, it's contract law. So that kid who is in Form 4, and you as the parent, Mr. and Mrs. Tom, Dick, and Harry, you have um, signed off that our child, Kwaita Namo, that's her name. Namo Inesu, that's our surname. Stupegiile, Stupegiile, send out a child, 16-year-old, to get married. That 16-year-old 
as long as they are lawfully married, can go into a contractual relationship that will be binding. And then number four, this one is uh, an exception as well, where the minor misrepresents her age. So what would happen in this case is that a, a minor would come in and uh, give um, an impression that they are a major. The major then relies on that information to enter into a contract. When they enter into that contract, so they are going into a contract with a, a misguided understanding of, of their minus age. So because they are not given that clear information on the minus age, when they enter into that contract, they are not going to seek enforcement because the contract is valid. They are going to seek enforcement because they have been hoodwinked. They have been cheated into a contract. So when this major now seeks um, restitution, when this major seeks uh, enforcement, so this is what happens. The court is going to basically um, order that the, the minor returns the substance that is still at hand, has not been consumed. So if it is a consumable and the minor has consumed everything, too bad. You should have been wiser as the older party. So if you are the older party, make sure that the people you are contracting with, first of all, they give you lawful identification. When they give you lawful identification, that is your basis of establishing that they do have capacity to enter into the contracts. Now, once that is established, you can now seek enforcement. So where um, the minor has cheated you, and uh, let's say they cheat you of goods that are worth 10,000 US dollars, and by the time you discover this and you're seeking recovery, your basis of seeking recovery, your argument would be unjust enrichment. What it means is that the minor cannot benefit and have the protection of the law by doing an unlawful act. So the law, in terms of the law of equity, is not going to support someone who comes before it with dirty hands. So what it means is the minor is in violation of the law. So when she is, or he or she is already in violation of the law, the law cannot protect the minor. But the law is not going to uh, impose an onerous burden on the minor and say, you now have an obligation to do good by this major, uh, by this um, adult when the adult went into a contract with the minor. So now let's look at some of those scenarios. Um, I can think of, um, have you seen your adverts? Uh, your, usually there's lots of adverts of liquor and tobacco. Those adverts have a clear um, exception rule, not to be, to, to be sold to people who are under 18. And you're going to see those even when you go into some uh, vending places where those simply state persons who are under 18 are not... Um, to be admitted into this place. So in a situation where, um, imagine a situation where a place has an age restriction, no under 18. Someone uh, gives the impression that they're above 18, walks in there and runs a bill. When they run a bill, it is later established that this person uh, has been consuming alcohol at a bar, but they are below 18. So the issue is the the owner of the enterprise might find it very difficult for them to uh, call back that bill and say, pay up, um, because the person will now come and say, no, I'm a, I'm a minor. And um, I'm, I'm hoping there are no teenagers that are thinking of uh, going into alcohol. It's just too soon. Let's leave that for adults and better still, don't even take it. It doesn't make your life better. So in that kind of a setup, the, the owner of the enterprise might find it difficult for for the minor to pay, let's assume they've ordered a round and they've ordered 10 pints. They've taken five of them. Then you discover, no, these are children. Now, of the five pints that they would have consumed, you might not have recourse for you to recover that money. That might not be easy for you to do. So this is, uh, I, I hope it's clear. Now, let's leave alcohol and tobacco and come to the internet online. When you're online, you're going to find that there are conditions, there are certain um provisions where you're supposed to click that you are above 18. So what um, that simply does is that it's trying to establish that you are not misrepresenting your age. You cannot come around and claim that you are a minor after being exposed to what you would have um, 
own through. You cannot claim to be a minor after having transacted. So once you click and uh, confirm that you are a major, you become liable. So why do they make you click that uh, particular provision check that you are above 18? They want you to confirm that you are taking full liability, full responsibility. Let's go to number two. The second one, who also lacks capacity. So this minor lacks capacity biologically. Age-wise, they are not yet mature. That's the reason why they will not have capacity. So they cannot claim that they are exercising a right under the free will theory. The will theory will not apply to them. And then on number two, we have the mental health care user. Now, um, this is um, a, a statement that I find to be correct as well as sensitive. What is a mental health care user? This is what would ordinarily refer to as an insane person, an imbecile. So these tend to be like derogatory terms. I prefer to use mental health care user because this is a person who has been established to have a mental condition and they, are, they may be taking some drugs to control it. So this person lacks capacity by virtue of a medical condition. So this person who lacks capacity by virtue of a medical condition, the issue is medically it has been established that they cannot operate at a certain mental level. They cannot arrive at a certain uh, rigor of decision making. So where this person does not have mental capacity to arrive at these determinations, guess what? Any decision they go into becomes void ab initio. There is a recent judgment that was made by the Zimbabwe Supreme Court as early as June 2020. Um, this was a case between Shiloh and Chiswa and um, car rental services. A very interesting case. What um, this gentleman did, his name, um, I mean, Shiloh and Chiswa, Chiswa is not the, 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 the respondent in this case. Uh, the respondent was Bernard. The, the, I mean, the, the, the issue when he started off, it was between Bernard and car rental services. Bernard being the sister, I mean, the brother, listen to me. Bernard being the brother to Shiloh. What Bernard did, Bernard went over to car rental services and hired a Ford Everest. Having hired this Ford Everest, he ran a bill of $13,868.90. Having run the bill on that particular vehicle, car rental, then realized that, no, there's some abuse here. They sought to repossess the car, which they did successfully. After having repossessed the car, they wanted to take legal action against Bernard. And, um, Shiloh, the sister to Bernard, now says, mm, no, maybe uh, let me assume he's dead. So Shiloh then assumed Bernard's debt, that she was going to settle the bill to car rentals, the 18000 bill to car rentals. Now, at a later date, Shiloh then recanted, withdrew from the agreement, and it would appear at some point, the reason why they want to take legal action, it was because he was owing them. But Shiloh knew that um, her brother was a mental health care user. So she didn't want the brother to be uh, exposed to the judicial process and maybe even institutionalized. So this is how she then accepted to take up a bill. Now she then decides, now I've changed my mind. Uh, I think there, were, there must have been some sharp lawyer. He says, I know I've changed my mind. I'm not going to pay that bill. So Car Rental then takes the matter up to the High Court. As they take it to the High Court, the High Court found that Car Rental and Bernard did not have a valid contract because Bernard did not have capacity to consent. Because of that lack of the capacity to consent, the contract was voided. It was held to be void up in issue. So now they escalate the matter to the Supreme Court. The issue now becomes, is it possible that one can um, turn back on a, an, an obligation that they have um, taken up where this particular obligation 
was on a contract that was uh, entered into by a mental health care user. So the Supreme Court now goes on to say, these are the words, I'm quoting them verbatim, right? The court are core, having found that the original agreement was void. There was no obligation in existence and therefore the appellant could not intervene or intercede in a non-existent obligation. Now, um, just to explain, court occur simply means the court before, the court that has just gone before. So the, in this case, this is the high court. So when the high court found that the judgment, I mean, listen to me, when the high court found that the contract was void, there was no obligation that could arise from a non-existent or a void contract. Which one is the void contract? The contract between car rentals and Bernard. So if there is no contract, obligations cannot arise. What does a contract do? A contract creates both, both rights and obligations. And where there is no free will, there is no consent, that lack of consent would mean obligations cannot arise. So Shylon could not have assumed an obligation where it did not even arise to begin with. So we, we, we did look at the ratio descendendi. So this is the principle that will then apply in terms of our contract law. So we want to go back and say, what does Shiloh and Chiswa versus car rentals uh, state as the law? The ratio descendendi is that a void contract does not bring obligations into existence. It does not confer rights. That becomes now the issue of consent. Are we together? Now, um, so car rentals lost the 13,000. So we need to have due diligence and be sure that whoever we, we enter into contracts with, they have that mental capacity. At uh, C, an intoxicated person. Um, notice the first one we looked at was uh, biological. The second one is mental. And the third one is self-induced. So an, an intoxicated person is somebody who's so inebriated that they do not know what is happening. Uh, they, they can be intoxicated by anything that can intoxicate people. So an intoxicated person cannot enter into a valid contract. And this intoxication, it's not everyone who has just taken a, a sip of alcohol who will claim I was intoxicated. The issue is on the level of intoxication. It should be so high, substantially high, that the person would not have the presence of mind to know what they did or what they entered into. So the burden of proof now rests on the one who is intoxicated. How do you prove that you were so drunk when you cannot remember how drunk you were? <laughs> Does this make sense? So prove that you were so drunk that you did not know what was happening. So how will you know that you were so drunk if you do not remember what happened? So prove that. Of course, you can always have other people who would come in and prove that you were so drunk. But for the business person, you are bottom line, bottom line. You have no business uh, signing contracts in a bar with drunk people. No good can come out of that. Um, on the part of intoxication, they, they, there is a part where it cannot be self-induced, where you, it can be induced by a third party. Someone has spiked your drink. You, you become intoxicated. So in that kind of a setup where it can be proven that some... Um, some uh, chemical substance was, uh, you know, introduced into your body and tempered with your mental capacity. That kind of intoxication moves from being self-induced as a defense. But now you're looking at duress or undue influence, uh, whichever you're going to apply there. Now, this is where you have not freely consented. Your consent has been tempered with. So once your consent is tempered with, either chemically or by force, we're going to look at this. This has the effect of vitiating a contract. It's, it, it tempers with the will theory. That cannot stand. It cannot be allowed. So where the consent has been tempered with, it immediately that falls away. That immediately falls away. Then at D, just to recap, we have looked at the biological, we have looked at the medical, we have looked at the... Um, the chemically induced, <laughs> this is the intoxication, self-induced or someone tempering with your consent. Now, the lack of capacity can also come in 
on um, financial standing where one is an insolvent um, or a prodigal. So I'm going to split this into two. On the insolvent, I'll speak more to the juristic person. You should remember by now, what is a juristic person, a legal person? This is um, an entity that is incorporated at law to operate trade as such. So this juristic person, it, it, it would have its directors, it would have its financial persons, people who can sign and enter into contracts figuratively. So these people are there. They are medically sound. They are biologically of age. They are not intoxicated, but they still lack capacity. What would have happened for them to lack capacity? This is a status that the court arrives at and puts this um, legal person under judicial management because they, they need to be assisted in handling their financial condition, their debt level. Because of that, the court then would say, we need to then put you under judicial management. So a curator is uh, uh, appointed. So this particular legal person lacks capacity because it has been taken away. Not that they cannot make decisions, not that they cannot enter into contracts. So this is a legal voiding of that capacity. So when that capacity is taken away, until you recover from your debt, until you service your creditors, that lack of capacity is a, a judicial lack. It is a legal withdrawal of capacity. And this is also applicable to individuals. And these are what you would call the prodigals. I'm not sure if we, we, we have these still applicable. I have not had time to check. But this is where someone cannot manage their affairs. I think most of us need to be declared as prodigals. You know, we, we cannot manage our affairs. Some of us, we are running families. Rentals are not paid. Fees is not paid. Food is not paid. But the bill at the bar is always paid. You know, we have many responsibilities that are extramarital. We're not taking care of our children. So would some of us really behave like prodigals. So where someone is a prodigal, the court will declare one as a prodigal. And when you have been declared as a prodigal, what would happen is that the court will then assign somebody over you to make sure they help you to manage your affairs. So these are the five issues that we have looked at. And the last two that we have looked at are the legal withdrawal of capacity. It can be on financial basis or even on just social standing. You're just failing to manage your issues. Now let's move on to item number B. We said uh, the first one that we've just looked at was lack of legal capacity. It would affect, it will impact the will theory. Number two, we have the intention to be legally bound. So this one is straightforward. The members must have the intention to be legally bound. So when we go into contracts, we usually um, operate under the assumption that we are friends, things will always be okay, there will be no problem. But life is not that simple. Some people that you thought were trustworthy, you discover they are not as trustworthy. So when you go into those contracts and um, you, you are operating under that um, premise, disagreements are going to arise. And when they arise, you are going to then seek redress through the courts. Now, when you seek redress through the courts, we want to say, did you consent that you're going to come before the courts so that the courts can, um, can uh, intervene and uh, bring a resolution to, to the dispute? So where there is no consent to come before the courts um, or an assumption that you will not come before the courts, based on that assumption, you may be excluded. The court will not intervene. Why? because there was no intention to be legally bound. So here are some of the assumptions that apply. Assumption number one, on our social or family agreements, family agreements, these family agreements that we go into ordinarily would not be uh, justiciable. That is the term, yes, I was looking for. Justiciable. So justiciable. Justice will not come and give it ability. Justiciable. So where the, the court would simply say the assumption is when you entered into this contract, you had no intention to be legally bound. Now, um, just imagine what will happen to the court role. The kind of promises that go on in our homes, promises that we're going to take our wives out to dinner 
and we still are yet to do that. It's been five years. Promises that we're going to do the laundry. Promises that we're going to do the loan outside. Promises that we're going to pick up children after school. Promises that we're going to go and visit our in-laws. Um, promises that we're going to go on vacations. You know, all these things. So when you're watching, um, is it, um, you know, there are some um, programs that you watch on TV, like your church duties and, and those kinds of programs. Now, so, so some of those agreements, they, they, they are borderline. They are borderline. So you, you want to look at that and say, is this an agreement that would have um, uh, been covered? So social agreements, family agreements, would not ordinarily be justiciable. They will not ordinarily be covered by the courts. Are you together? Now, the second one, where there are agreements that are of a commercial nature, here's the assumption. The assumption is that you have an intention to be legally bound. And we've already mentioned this under the sanctity theory of contract. So because of sanctity, the contract is backed. There's a comfort letter of some sort to say, should anything go wrong, the court will come to your aid. This is why people are going to go there and uh, take the risk. So, 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 so that people will continue to engage in these contracts. There is that assumption. So when you then seek to operate um, in commercial space, the assumption is that you intend to be legally bound. I hope this is clear. So should you have any dispute there, as long as we can prove that this is a commercial transaction, if it is a commercial transaction, it is a transaction that has been entered into by a customer and a supplier. It's commercial. It is a transaction that has been entered into for profit. A price, a consideration has been paid. In that case, it becomes commercial. When it becomes commercial, the courts are going to intervene. Are you together? So, so, so we, we want to make sure that those kind of contracts are clearly stated. And better still in writing. Now, when you look at the substance of the contract, you want to even look out for some of those clauses where someone would say, um, this is a, a contract that is being entered. Uh, this is a memorandum of agreement that is being entered um, subject to an agreement. So now you come and you wave that more, that MOU, and you're saying we have an agreement. And yet there is a clause somewhere in there that says this is subject to agreement. So which means it is not yet binding. It is something that is yet to be finalized. So those are some of those um, terms in the contract that would make it um, lack certainty, legal certainty. When it lacks that certainty, you may not enforce it. That would be the, the limitation. Now, um, that besides, there is also the essentials of a contract. These are very, very important. The essentials of the contract are what appear above the signature. So when the parties sign, they're basically accepting what is before the signature. So on these essentials of the contract, they need to be stated. And secondly, they need to be explicit. They need to be certain. They need to be known, just like in a custom, that issue of certainty. We must know what the parties agreed to. So signing for a term that is not clear does not make it a contract. It will still be void because... The, 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 a material term is not clear. And what are some of these terms that are deemed essential to a contract? Number one, the subject of the contract. Number two, identity of the debtor in the obligation. I'm going to explain this. These two, they, they sound a bit convoluted. Number three, price. This one is straightforward. And on number four, uh, besides price, you're also looking at the quality of... Um, the item that you are contracting into over. All right. So what, are, what, 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 what should it um, be like? And number five, the nature of the contract. So now let us look at uh, these five briefly. Uh, I'm going to spend a little more time on those things that um, are not so easy to understand. On the subject of the contract. Now, as a student of the university, you have uh, entered into a contract with the university to receive tutorial, lectures. And um, these particular lectures that you are receiving, one of them is commercial law. That's the one you're taking. So as a commercial law student, what have you contracted for? 
you have contracted to receive a basic understanding of how the law operates and imparts business. So this is the subject of the contract that you have entered with the university. Now, should you be expecting that after the end of the semester, after the end of the program, you are going to be representing people who have disputes um, on contract law after taking commercial law one, then the subject of the contract may be a problem here. This course is not going to make you a lawyer. This course is going to make you understand business operations from a legal perspective. It does not replace lawyers. So you're not going to go into a boardroom next time and say, no, I did business law. I'm a lawyer. I can now advise. I can take care of this. No, 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 no. It just helps you how to appreciate the legal environment. That's what the course does. So it does not replace lawyers. It doesn't. It doesn't. When you want to do that, go and study law and become a lawyer. Now, in this context, because the subject of the contract is clearly stated, where parties are not at the same platform as far as the reason for entering the contract, what we then have in that case is a common mistake. So what a common mistake would do is that it will void the contract up initial. It would make the contract void and absent initially. Why? Because we thought we were contracting into this uh, agreement, but we just didn't get it. It flew over our heads. And number two, there is the data in obligation. What this difficult term simply means is that the person that you are entering into a contract with is the one you didn't intend to enter into a contract with. So you went into a contract with the wrong person. So it must be the wrong person. I want to sell this to Mr. Mkanda and I find myself selling it to Mr. Mboff. When I do that, this is the wrong data in obligation. The person who has an obligation to pay is the wrong person. If, if I send my money to the wrong person, the person I am sending the money to is the wrong person. That's the wrong person. So the contract will not come into existence. Now, um, we could have a scenario where someone uh, is transacting on mobile platforms and you, you, you're paying for goods and, and you send the, the, the money to the wrong digit, to the wrong number. Just by one digit, you're sending money to the wrong place. When you do so, that is not a valid contract because the, you are in receipt of these funds in error. It is a mistake. So that would void the contract. I, I hope the mechanisms of you recovering that money at some point somehow. So, um, but the, 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 the error must be a material one. Let's have an example. Um, uh, let's say I have a student in the class. Now the university identifies you with a student ID number. It also identifies you with your surname and your name. So if I misspell your name, but get your ID number correctly, that would not result in um, a wrongful uh, identification. The data, the identity of the data in obligation does not change besides the misspelled name. So a misspelling of the name would not necessarily mean it's the wrong person. And being addressed as um, uh, uh, with a different name does not necessarily make you the wrong person. You are still the person who is intended to be entered into the contract with. So that will still be a binding contract. I hope this is clear. At C, on price, this one is straightforward. So we, we, we said a price is basically consideration. And uh, we, we, we looked at it from a business sense and we said it is a cost of production. Number two, the cost of delivery. And number three, the markup. A combination of all these three will give us a price. So where the price is um, stated, what uh, follows then is that the parties have materially agreed. And should there be a, sit a, a situation where the price is not known, there must be a method of how it is going to be established. So where a method has been stated to say, this is how we're going to arrive at the price, a contract will still be valid without the dollar figure, as long as the price is stated to say, this is how we are going to arrive at it. Should we need to determine how much the goods are worth? So it will still be um, a valid contract. Now, um, the Supreme Court, again, in 2020, I think, uh, issued a judgment in uh, Breastplate uh, Private Limited versus Cambria, Africa. Now, what happened here was uh, a bit of a, an interesting one. It was a combination of price and uh, currency. 
what happened is um we we the 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 company um um contracted to buy shares right um this is breastplate contracted to buy shares and uh, they they were buying these shares from a zambian company uh the company being uh milkham milkham the 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 agreement was to pay uh, 46347 dollars and this was to be agreed uh to be paid in united states dollars as of 2016 now having entered into this agreement they went on to service this uh debt up to um about they they were owing about 30000 or so so in 2019 now the government of zimbabwe brought in this multi currency and uh we basically went back to rtgs so now what uh, breastplate wanted to do now was to service this particular debt in bond notes in rtgs and uh, their basis was um based on the promulgation uh, si33 of 2019 and si142 of 2019 we can now pay in rtgs so they are now trying to pay a us dollar debt in rtgs and in so trying to do they are trying to change the material price so where is the price issue here the price issue is on number 1 the currency that is to be used in effect in the payment number 2 the value that you are going to hold at hand is going to be materially different i mean us dollar versus rtgs um uh, those who have used rtgs are going to tell you the two are not equivalent even if you make them equivalent you can cross rate them but the frustration of using an rtgs will limit you in terms of what you can do with it so from this argument now they appear before the court and um breastplate is seeking to service this bill in rtgs now when they went in the court then said no 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 there is no way you are going to come to this conclusion and i want us to consider uh the statement of uh, patel he was a uh, presiding judge in in obita dictum um at pages 14 to 15 he, this is what he had to say to conclude on this aspect the concept of legal tender in its ordinary signification denotes money or currency in official circulation that must be accepted if offered in payment of a debt if the realm of contractual relations all right sorry in the realm of contractual relations what this means is that the debtor is entitled to settle his debt through the medium of legal tender are we together legal tender so this is where the way the rtgs part and conversely in addition to this the creditor is obliged to accept that tender the latter that is the creditor has no choice or latitude in the matter on the other hand so you can service it as well as legal tender on the other hand unless explicitly proscribed by statute as discussed below so if in this case the the, the statute is there that says you cannot use this particular uh, currency to pay it says there is nothing under the common law to preclude the debtor from discharging his debt in any currency or medium of exchange other than the officially designated legal tender including any foreign currency so long so long as the creditor is prepared to accept such payment in settlement of debt so in this case the creditor is not prepared to accept the rtgs value so it that will fall away now he goes on this arises by virtue of the time honored doctrine of freedom of contract which in my view remains intact and unimpaired by the provisions of statutory instrument 142 of 2019 so what is the time honored freedom of contract the freedom of contract is that we can impose obligations upon ourselves and when we do so we can keep third parties out of our agreement so when parties then say we are going to transact in us dollars they have agreed there is no way the state is going to come in and interfere because you guys have agreed
So we are going to honor that. That is what the court is going to do. It will honor that as long as there is no statute that says you cannot pay in United States dollars. If the statute is there, surely the government is going to honor the agreement. So the agreement was bound and, and, and it was considered to subsist. So this now becomes, um, becomes a ratio decedent. It becomes a principle. So should there be a contract that you entered into and it was United States dollars and it is clearly stated as such, if you agreed based on the principle of freedom of contract, you are entitled to United States dollars and you should not be obliged to take the RTGS value unless, of course, that is what you have accepted. Let's look at the quality of the thing by gain for. What is the quality of the thing by gain for? This one is interesting. On the quality of the thing by gain for, anything that you purchase must be fit for use. It must be fit for use. Now, what is the fit for purpose? When you say, I'm going to purchase a car, you cannot buy uh, the new, the latest Land Rover only to get to the shop and discover it has no wheels. It is lifted up. They say, no, 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 you bought the car. You forgot to tell us you needed the wheels. No, 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 no. The, the, the quality, it must be something that I can drive. You cannot make me buy things that I cannot drive. When you are buying a brand new phone, uh, Samsung S20, for it to be fit for purpose, the assumption is that it's not going to have a cracked screen. It's going to have a battery. You cannot buy something that does not have a battery and you're told it's brand new. You, you, you get it from Amazon or wherever, you unpack it and you discover it has a cracked screen. So there, there is no way you're going to then say uh, you need it to be more explicit. So the next time you find an advert where a car is being sold, the question would be, does it have wheels? Does it have doors? Does it have seats? You know, that would be an absurd question, isn't it? So if it is not qualitative, then it will not meet those requirements. It will not come within that ambit. And then lastly, the nature of the contract. Um, this one is straightforward. Let's say you are renting premises. When you're renting premises, th there is no way you would say, um, I'm renting premises and therefore um, after 10 years, the house will be mine. No, 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 no. You, you, you are just a, a lessee, a lesser, that, 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 that is your relationship. You are leasing, you know? So, so, so the lessee has list the house to you. That does not necessarily mean the house is now yours, no matter how long you stay in it. So the nature of the contract is like that. So when you are then going to say, I want to buy the house, to purchase the house, then you are going to go the extra mile of registering it as such. That is the nature of the contract. So the nature of the contract is the one that determines how we are going to operate. What is it in our scope of operation? What have we contracted into? Now, when all these three that are preceding are in place, what then are we going to look at? Do we have consensus? Do we have agreement? So you take all these three and you say, ah, surely, surely there was capacity. Not only was there capacity, the essential terms of the contract were also cleared and there was an intention to be bound legally. With all these three, lastly, there was an agreement. There is consensus ad idem. Consensus can be identified. This is how I can um, try and contextualize how we understand it. Consensus identified. Idem. Consensus from the beginning. It is there. So what are those things that will help us to establish consensus? Unfortunately, uh, this is not something that you can hold on to and say, this is consensus. I have it here. It, it is a subjective uh, state of the mind. So when you are now going into an issue of what was agreed, it sounds like a bit of some psychology study where you want to go into the minds of people and say, this is what you agreed to. Because most of us have selective amnesia. When a contract seems to be suitable, we say, no, that's not what I intended. No, that's not what I understood it to be. So people are going to always want to wiggle out of contracts. And um, as late as 18, that was a long time ago, 1871, this is what... Uh, Blackburn, J. Smith, um, in, in, in Blackburn versus, um, versus Smith, Hughes. This is the Law Review, Volume 6 of the Queen's Bench, at page 597. This is what the judge had to say. Open quotes. If whatever a man's real intention may be, he so conducts himself that a reasonable man 
would believe that he was assenting to the terms proposed by the other party. And that other party, upon that belief, enters into this contract with him. The man thus conducting himself would be equally bound as if he had intended to agree to the other party's terms. Full stop and close quotes. Now notice this. It is not something that we are going to say, here it is, it's concrete, we need to present your brain in court. We're simply saying your conduct. If your conduct gave the other person the impression that you were consenting, and this other person reasonably, reasonably came to the conclusion that you are consenting, and so entered into this contract, you are going to be deemed to have consented by conduct. So we are simply going to look at your conduct ultimately. And the one who is making this conclusion must also come to a reasonable conclusion. It cannot just be um, on the whim and you just think, okay, I think I, I, uh, you, you must be intending to enter into a contract with me. You must also make a reasonable conclusion. You cannot be hearing voices in your head and imagining people going into contracts with you and then suddenly you start uh, committing yourself. Th th that should not be, th th that's not how it should go. That's not how it should go. Now, um, maybe let us uh, quickly roll over to the offer. Now, we have looked at consent. So when we have established on the will theory, the capacity is cleared, all these have been covered. There has to be an offer that has to be made for a contract to be binding. This is another essential issue of a contract, an offer. What is this offer? The offer basically is what is being given, what is being extended. So this is what the person gives. And for them to give these, you are going to notice that the essential terms of the contract are basically what are being offered. So it will be the subject that we are contracting over. That is what is being offered. Number two, it is the price. That is what is being offered. Number three, it is the quality of the thing that is being bargained for. And now for the other two that we, 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 we that, that would not ideally come before the offer or on the offer aspect, that would be the nature of the contract and the, the identity of the data and obligation. These two are the general features of the contract. They, they are not, you are not offering me. You are not um, offering um, the nature of the contract as it were. You are simply identifying it's a classification. So these other two, they become just the features. But on these three that we've already identified, those make up the offer as it were. So this offer is the one that is being made by the offer to the offeree. Now I'm taking you back to church, offering. So when you are giving an offering, you are the offerer. And the one receiving the offering is the offeree. All right, I, I hope that makes sense. So offeree, offerer, offeree, offerer. You, you, you would want to get your, your head wrapped around that. So these are the issues that we look at. So the offer basically must be given to a person that is clearly known identified person. Remember, identif the identity of the data and obligation, and it must be given to an individual. Of course, you'd have scenarios where the offer is open-ended. It is to anyone. These would be like your, your public offers. Uh, should you find this, this, and that of, of mine, uh, there is a reward that has been given. That is a public offer to anyone. So the, the one who then finds these comes within the, the, the scope to claim. So they come through and they're given whatever they would have claimed out together. So as far as the offer is concerned, it must be given to an individual, an individual. But of course, you're going to find interesting scenarios where you would have um, an offer that is not clearly given to an individual. Um, look at your, there used to be those parking slots in town that you were, when you parked, when you used to use coins. You drop some coins in there and uh, you can park your vehicle for 30 minutes, for an hour, in some places for two hours. So those slot machines kind of uh, situations. If you look at those, the question of who is the offer, who is the offeree becomes a bit uh, vague. It's not as clear. 
but the concept is still applicable. The one who's going to come in and pay is the one offering. And the offering is the one receiving our together. So if, if we just get it from the context of church, it will become easy for us to understand. All right. So now when we look at that kind of an offering offer kind of a situation, you now take the same scenario and say in our commercial practice, now let's put it in a, in a, um, a commercial retail. You're working into OKs, pick and pay, choppies, shop right, um, macro, uh, game, whatever you're working into. When an establishment is set up there, many a time we're quick to think, ah, they're offering a service to the community. Then that would mean pick and pay is now the offerer. No, 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 no. Pick and pay does not become the offerer. The offerer is the one who uh, walks into the establishment following an invitation from pick and pay. Come and shop with us. Come and buy from us. So that is the invitation. Even on the tenders, that is the invitation to treat. So anyone who calls you and says, come, let's negotiate, is making an invitation to treat. So when you are walking over there, you are being invited, you are responding to an invitation. So when you go there and you've responded to the invitation, guess what? This is where now you are going to make the offer. And at what point do you make the offer? At the till. So you get there, you're saying, okay, this is the price. I want a loaf of bread. It will cost me uh, one United States dollars. You pick up that loaf of bread. You know the price. You have ascertained that the quality is good for purpose. You are then walking with that loaf of bread to the till. You have not yet made the offer. You are still showing your intention, your intention to be legally bound, your intention to enter into a contract. When you then get to the till, this is where now you offer the purchase value. When you hand out that dollar, don't hand out $10 or $20, they'll not have changed. Okay, jokes aside. Um, but have you noticed that when you get to the till, this is something that my wife uh, has been uh, complaining about and I'll challenge you to, to do the same as well. Price that you see on the price tag and the total value that you, you, you pay out by the till that don't usually seem to, to tally. Prices tend to change by the till compared to what you'd have seen um, uh, displayed. So in, in those kinds of uh, a setup, that is not a valid contract. Why? Because a material term is missing. So if you are picking something that is supposed to be a dollar, you get to the till, it is now a dollar fifty. There is a counter offer that has been made as far as the price is concerned. So the contract basically falls apart at that point and you come up with a new one. You start to negotiate on a dollar fifty because that is the new price. So the price that is for the good that you carried from the, 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 the shelves has changed. So when it changes, the contract has been cancelled midway. A counter offer has been made because you are coming in to offer a dollar. Then the person says, no, it's now a dollar fifty. That's a new contract. I, I hope it makes sense. So this is the offer and the agreement kind of a setup. Maybe um, the last example, the last example, we will maybe second from last year, the penultimate one. Now, we will not always have scenarios where you would walk into a shop and pick goods and go to the till. You can walk into a tuck shop, Mr. MK's tuck shop in his rural area. There is no walk-in service. There is a huge counter, concrete slab that keeps you out. So when you are there, you simply getting, uh, may, may I have a um, bottle of milk? May I have uh, two loaves of bread? May I have a packet of leaves? May I have two kgs of sugar? Mr. MK is going to pick those things and hand them over to you. So the fact that he picks those things for you does not necessarily make him the offerer. You still remain the offerer. Why? Because he is just offering a service of picking those things. And I hope he doesn't charge you uh, for, for picking those, those, those goods for you. All right. Now let's go to when we knock off, we're going home. We also buy goods from our, um, uh, the, the vendors on the roadside. Uh, whether they are buying, they are purchasing, selling second-hand clothes or they are selling their vegetables. You know, you see someone with a stack of tomatoes, there are five or eight of them. There is no price tag there. So when you walk over and you say, um, how much are the tomatoes? And, uh, you know, there are those ladies who are out there being scorched by the sun all day long. Just a dollar. So the fact that they have stacked these, off the, 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 these tomatoes on the roadside, they've stacked these clothes on the roadside, it's an invitation to trade. 
They're simply saying, come, let's negotiate on this stack of tomatoes. So when you now come and you are discussing about the stack of tomatoes, you, you, you are establishing how much is the price. The price is a dollar. Then you say, ah, dollar for eight. No, if you add two more, I'll give you a dollar. Now the negotiation is going on. Now this is a counter offer where you're saying, um, if you give me 10 of these, I'll give you a dollar. So you, 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 the offer that is being made is not the offer for for um, dollar for eight. You're making an offer for dollar for 10. So the dollar for eight was an invitation to treat. It's an advert. Are we together? Now the dollar for 10 is the offer you are making. So if she accepts the dollar for 10, of course, with a bit of remonstration, you know, I, I woke up in the morning, I ordered these 40 kilometers away. No, but you're my customer. There you are. You're given um, 10 tomatoes for a for dollar. That means you're getting them at about 10 cents each. So in, in that kind of a setup, when you get those tomatoes, guess what? You have been in a contractual relationship. Although it is not written down, we actually enter into contracts every day of our lives. That's what we're doing. We're entering into these contracts every day of our lives. We cannot avoid them. They're there. They're there. Now, when we have gone into these contracts, take note, a counter offer will always invalidate the contract, the previous offer. So we, we, where a counter offer has been given, it becomes a new offer. Am I making sense? So let us go back to, the, to that lady. Let's say you have said, I'll give you a um, uh, dollar for 10. Says, ah, dollar for 10 would be too much. No, let me give you nine. And she takes those nine, packs them into the what? Into the bag and hands the, the plastic bag to you. When you accept the nine and you give her the dollar, at this point, we now want to say who is the offerer and who is the offeree. So you offer the dollar for 10. She packs nine and hands them over. You give her a dollar. She packs nine. She has invalidated your offer of a dollar for 10. She now becomes the offerer by giving you nine instead of 10. And you now paying the dollar, you become the offeree. Am I making sense? You become, you know, now you, you are receiving the offer in exchange for a dollar. So, so, so this now sort of becomes upside down. It doesn't always mean the one who is paying out the cash is the one who is the offerer. Okay. Now, um, these um, contracts can basically be taken away. And uh, how would they be taken away? How will they be undone? When an offer is retrieved, this is called revocation. You revoke, you take back the offer. When you take back the offer, you undo it. When you undo the offer, the contract is gone, it's dead. So at that point, it does not come into life. And number two, you could have a situation where you are told this contract is uh, open up to this period. So if you do not accept it by this period and the period lapses, Guess what? The contract does not come into existence because of the offer principle. It was not accepted within the set time. Even where there is no set time, within a reasonable time. And generally, the reasonable time in terms of the Pres Prescription Act is 10 working days. So 10 working days is fair. Surely you should have made up your mind by then. And then number four, this is the other one where we looked at a rejection of the offer. You had offered one for 10 and this one gives you nine for 10. You can discuss this and come to an agreement or the rejection can be implied. So where she just packs and gives it to you, it is an implied rejection. So when that rejection has been given, this particular offer ceases to exist. Let's take a brief break. And um, when we come back, we're going to be looking at acceptance and um, we'll take it up from there. Having considered the offer, um, let us continue and look at uh, acceptance now. On acceptance, what um, we did as we we're looking at the offer is we did make mention of uh, acceptance, but in passing. So what we are going to find is that as far as acceptance is concerned, where an offer has been given, this acceptance has to be unconditional. A conditional acceptance has the effect of undoing an offer. You would remember we made mention of uh, the lady making an implied rejection. So an implied rejection would arise where the, the lady would have said, instead of giving you 10 tomatoes, I'll give you nine. 
packs and hands over to the customer. The customer proceeds to pay. That is what you would uh, term as an implied rejection. So an acceptance should be unconditional. It must be unqualified. It must not have a writing statement to it. So once it is given, it should uh, always apply as the general acceptance. So how can this acceptance, this yes statement be given? Uh, number one, obviously, verbally. The offer has been made and the person says, I accept. They do so verbally. They verbalize it. Number two, it can be in writing. So when an acceptance has been given in writing, what happens is there is a provision under the contract or under the terms that are being offered where someone will then have to sign and say, I accept the terms above. So when one accepts in writing, what it means is that they are accepting all the terms that precede. An interesting case arose in 2020. That was uh, Kokum versus Tarua Tarua. In this case, Mr. Tarua was a finance manager of some sort. And uh, he was supposed to be moved from uh, one division of the same company to another holding company or something like that. Mr. Tarua signed that he was going to assume um, responsibility at the new station. And subsequent to signing and accepting that he was going to assume responsibility there, he then did not report for duty. Not only did, not, did he not report for duty, he continued to report at the station where he had been reassigned from. Basically, he refused to, to assume responsibility there. And uh, he goes on to argue that uh, what the employer was doing in essence was to vary his terms of contract. And that was um, unlawful, as it were. So this is a matter that went through the courts and ultimately came to the Supreme Court. And Justice Matonzi, in uh, considering this, he had this to say. In considering the lawfulness of the appellant's action, it is important to start from the standpoint that upon the respondent being transferred to Triple C Private Limited, he signed the letter of appointment on the space provided for acceptance of new contract. He then registered his concerns with the appellant as he was entitled to do so. The respondent also went on to report a dispute to a labor officer. This was also proper. And the dispute to a labor officer, after having been uh, reported, uh, reported, he says this was also proper, and the dispute would have been dealt with according to the law. His biggest undoing was the dogged refusal to report for duty assigned to him. It meant the parties could not contractually move forward together. Now, we want to establish what is the ratio dissidenti. What is Justice Matonsi saying? The principle of the law that he brings across is, now let's, let's apply this, where there is no acceptance. The acceptance that has been given is followed by a conditional conduct. This conditional conduct would make it impossible for parties to contractually move forward together. That is the principle. So it doesn't matter what Taruva did. So this is what you are now going to say. As we go into all other cases, we are checking, has the acceptance been followed by a conduct that is opposite to what the party has agreed to? Has the acceptance been followed by a statement that negates the acceptance that has been given before? Should that be the case, it is impossible for the parties to move forward together. So what does this do in essence? That denial of an acceptance would invalidate a contract. At number two, at number three, I mean, number one was verbal, number two, in writing. Number three, it has to be by conduct. Now, you remember the, the issue of um, the offerer and the offeree that we discussed earlier, the vendor and, um, and the shopper. The gentleman who's coming to shop before this lady, 
finds that the lady, after he has made an offer of a dollar for 10 tomatoes, the lady says, no, it's okay, it's okay, and packs nine and hands them over to this gentleman. So we discuss that and we say, it doesn't necessarily mean that the offerer will always be the one who pays. You could have a situation whereby a counter offer would mean the one who had an invitation to treat would have an invitation to treat, an offer to pay, and then a counter offer, which is accepted. So the nine tomatoes that are packed and handed over, they constitute an offer through conduct. So when the gentleman now parts with his dollar, he is the one who is now receiving, he's accepting the offer. So that uh, acceptance becomes the acceptance by conduct. Paying becomes the acceptance of the offer by conduct from the offerer. So he becomes the offeree. So the offeree is the one who accepts, in other words. I hope this makes sense. So when we come to accepting these offers, we want to take note of the following. Number one, as Hughes uh, submitted in Smith versus Hughes, it has to be conduct that is reasonable. So it is not just conduct, but the one who then accepts must accept reasonable conduct, isn't it? So now when we come to acceptance by conduct, notice that it um, sort of assumes that the conduct is going to be positive action. So we cannot have negative action being used as a basis of acceptance. For an example, you cannot have a situation where um, you're going to be told, accept this offer by in three days' time. If you don't accept it, you'll be deemed to have accepted it anyway. It doesn't work that way. When you're accepting an offer, you must make a positive action. So in this case where one would um, not respond, for an example, this can only be used to raise issues on that you have waived your right to respond, not that you you, you can be forced into accepting by by silence. That, 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 that cannot work. That cannot work. So this is basically how our um, contracts are designed. They're going to be designed on uh, the will theory and the will theory will take into account the five items we have looked at. Do the parties have capacity? Do, you have, do they have an intention to be bound? Besides having an intention to be bound, are the terms and conditions certain? And what are those terms and conditions? Go on and enumerate them. When you've looked at all those terms, the subject matter of the contract, the parties to the contract, you want to look at um, the price that is to be paid, the consideration. Number three, you would also want to look at um, the nature of the contract. And uh, you may also want to look at the quality of the, 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 the item that is being bargained for. If these are all in, now you want to say, ultimately, is there consensus ad idem? Are the parties in agreement? What would they be in agreement on? These are the last two pillars that we have looked at. They should be in agreement on the offer. And the offer will cover the first three items on the essential elements of the contract. The subject of the contract, they must cover the, um, the, the, the party that is indebted to the obligation, the one who has to do something. And then number three, price. Uh, oh, sorry. It, it have to the price, the quality of um, goods that are being gained for. So all these will constitute an offer. And to whom are these being made? Now it will be the offeree and the offerer. So the offerer is the one who makes the contract. And the one who now has a duty to pay becomes the, the party, the identification of the party that is indebted to the obligation. That is the offeree, in other words, who has an obligation to pay the price. That is the customer. So do we have a customer that is clearly identified and marked? So if that customer then goes on to pay, the contract is complete. It need not necessarily be in writing, but better still for it to be in writing. Are you together? Now, um, having looked at this, the contract then we're going to say there is consensus ad idem. The parties have come together. There is a meeting of the minds. Having had the meeting of the minds, it doesn't always follow that when contracts stand, they will always stand. Some of them are void up initial, void and absent initially from the initiate, initial stage, void up initial. 
this is how I got it and I think it will help you. So these are void and void up in issue. But some of the contracts, you may find that they may go on, but somewhere along the line, things do not work out right. And because of that, the contract will collapse. What are some of these reasons that will make a contract collapse? At number one, fraud. Number two, an error. Number three, duress. Now, let us go on and look at fraud. Fraud, F-R-A-U-D. Not fraud, fraud. I have had my wife give me a problem with this word. Uh, I, I find fraud coming out instead of fraud. Right, so if you say fraud, yeah, it depends on which school you went to. I went to a Krupsi school, so forgive me. Um, fraud. So what is this fraud? Fraud is where it happens between the parties to the contract. But one of the parties intentionally sets out to deceive the other, to mislead the other party. So there must be an intention to mislead. Take note of that. So because of this intention to mislead, from the point where this fraud takes place, the contract would have subsisted before. It is pure before. The fraud is going to taint the contract from one point going forward. So this is where now the contract would become uh, void from that point going forward. So what we want to establish is from the point where the contract becomes tainted, we want to say, before then, the contract stands. Afterwards, the contract must fall apart. So when it falls apart, what happens is the court would say, for the parties that have been in the contract, let us return them to the point before integrity was lost. And now the legal term will be restitutio in integrum. So I, I don't think it has anything to do with integrity, but at the back of my mind, I said, restitution, take them back to the point before integrity was lost, lack of integrity. That way you'll understand it. So take them back to that position. That is restitutio in integrum. So parties are being taken back to where they were before the contract collapsed. So if the fraud takes place where at the beginning, of the contract, what will happen is that the contract will never take off. It becomes void up in issue. So even if the parties went on, they went on under a misguided understanding that they had a contract, yet they did not have one. And should it so happen that the contract would have been performed to a certain stage, at the point when the fraud comes in, that is the, po the cutoff point. Now let's uh, try and uh, visualize... Um, an example, I'll use an example in the Bible, an example in the Bible, where one has misled another. You, you, you will find this one interesting. There was a man in the Bible, his name was Jacob. He later on became Israel. Jacob means a usurper. Now, what Jacob did is that he misled, actually he stole. He stole his brother's birthright or he took it, I don't know, whatever. But what I want to drive at is after he's run off from home, running from his uh, brother once uh, to take his life, he emigrates to Laban, where as he works there for his uncle, he falls in love with his cousin, Rachel. There were two ladies, Rachel and Leah. The one that he loved was Rachel, and she was the younger one, the mother of Joseph and Benjamin. Now, having loved Rachel, uh, Joseph says um, to his uncle, I want to take um, Rachel's hand in marriage, if you would allow me. Now, they begin the negotiations. So what is this now? This is a marriage contract. So the subject of the contract is marriage. Number two, who are the parties? The parties are Laban and Jacob, what is the price that is to be paid in exchange for the performance of this marriage? For me to give you Rachel's hand in marriage, what should you do? Work for me for seven years. The price is established. What is the quality of the item that is bargained for? 
a young lady, I believe a virgin, beautiful, all those are the qualities that are stated. Ag agreed. Let's go on to number four. Now that we are agreed on this aspect of equality, what then are the, what is the nature of this contract? This contract should be a marriage contract. You are taking for life. You are not renting, you are not leasing. She is yours for life. And having agreed, what does Jacob do? He goes off to work. Seven years expire. After those seven years, now we have um, a party that has to be identified. The one who has an obligation, the debtor in obligation. The first obligation must rest with um, Jacob, who must work. Jacob has done his work. The obligation shifts now, and the right becomes Jacob's now. So Jacob now has a right. Initially, the right is with Laban. Laban has a daughter, and he has a right to a dowry price from Jacob. So Jacob says, I will offset it with labor. When Jacob has offset the labor, what happens is that the debt and obligation shifts and moves to Laban this time. Now Laban has an obligation to release, provide the contracted pride. So on the day when the contracted pride is supposed to be released, what does Laban do? He does a switch and he provides Leah instead of Rachel. So what Laban now does is intentionally, intentionally mislead Jacob, who is expecting to receive Rachel under the cover of night. He is given Leah only to discover in the morning he was given the wrong bride. So this now becomes fraud. So the question would be, when did this fraudulent behavior take place? It took place at seven years. It doesn't take place at year zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, up to year seven. So up to year seven, the contract is still being performed. It is binding. It is valid. So at that point, what should have happened then is that the parties must be taken back to where they were before. So having been given the wrong wife. What should happen? Leah must be sent back to her father. What should uh, um, Jacob receive? Fair compensation for seven years work. That's what he should receive as fair compensation. Of course, he goes on to work for the next seven years for the second wife. That's what love does. But now restitution integram would say, let us assume that Jacob had not worked for the seven years. But that is a fictional assumption. So compensate his loss in monetary terms. That's where he now gets the value for money. That's how it would work. Now, in this case, where you're going to have fraud that happens later on, we appreciate that the contract has been performed for seven years. The first part cannot be taken away. That is the fraud aspect. I gave an example of... Um, a young man who makes a, a young a, a minor who makes a misrepresentation that they are of age, you could have a misrepresentation that is made verbally, but the same can also forge an ID and present it. That would be fraudulent behavior. So the ID is being presented as a way of misleading the other party. That is where the fraud comes in. So the the fraud aspect is um, an umbrella. Anything that is meant to mislead would be fraudulent. So someone can um, mislead through their mouth. They can make a claim that is fraudulent. They can submit documents that are fraudulent. Anything that is designed to mislead. Now you'd have a cousin of fraud. A cousin of fraud would not necessarily be fraud, but it's misrepresentation. What is misrepresentation? Misrepresentation is basically stating, um, making claims that are not factually accurate. These may not always lead to um, behavior that is fraudulent. But you can always have a misrepresentation in a fraud. But yet you will not always have fraud in misrepresentation. I, I hope this makes sense. So the factual inaccuracy is what 
then leads us to misrepresentation. So the factual inaccuracies that we can come up with, it is where now you're going to have a situation whereby um, the minor claims that they are 18 when they are not 18. So let's have a situation where someone who is 17 claims that they are 18 without the due diligence of asking for identification. One can make that mistake and say, um, honestly, he looked 18. She looked 18. But you are making an assessment. Um, at the end of the day, that kind of a misrepresentation cannot and should not be accepted wholesale. Yes, it is an unfactual uh, misrepresentation. But can a 10-year-old, 10-year-old grade 5, walk into a bar and claim to be 18 and the bartender says he claimed to be 18. So it, it must be something that a reasonable person would have fallen for this. If it becomes an absurd claim, you know, it's just like me claiming to be colored, me claiming to be white. It's absurd. You not even give it a second thought. You just say, Mr. MK, well, what's wrong with you? Now, we, we cannot have that kind of a, a claim being accepted. A misrepresentation of that form would not be given any entertainment. So it, it cannot be just any inaccurate statement. It would also have resulted in a reasonable person, a reasonable person falling for it, a reasonable person. So it's not just conduct, it's not just any claim. We are also saying the burden is upon the one who's entering into those contracts to exercise reasonability. So where reasonability is lacking, you cannot turn around and say, Oh, surely, surely there was a misrepresentation. How did you expect me to respond? No, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Now, there is the other factual inaccuracy that you can find. Um, I usually find these in the commercial um, ads. They're, they're very interesting ones. Um, there is the Domestos advert. I'll challenge you to check the Domestos advert. I think they've actually even added... Um, uh, it even kills COVID, if I'm not mistaken. Um, what Domestos claims is that it kills 99% of all non-germs. 99% of all non-germs. Do they know all the germs? Does it really kill? Has it been tried on all non-germs? Number three, known by who? <laughs> Are you getting that? All non-germs. Some known germs have not yet been documented. They've not been named. So, but they're still known some way by somebody else who is not known. So can Domestos come in and say, actually, yes, yes, even the germ that we do not know and we have never seen it, has not been discovered or named scientifically. Domestos kills that germ as well. Have they tested that? Have they established it factually? It has not been established. So that is not a factually correct statement. It's a misrepresentation. But is it something that you can then go there and say, I'm suing Domestos for the misrepresentation? No, you can't. An advert is an invitation to treat. It's a bluff. <laughs> so when people make adverts and they'll tell you, this, the, the, this is the best drink in the country. This is the, uh, this is the best tutorial in the world. Mr. MK is the best lecturer in the world. Best by whose assessment? How big is the world? So, so, so these are paths that, that, that people say so that uh, you can buy their stuff. They are basically advertising. So even though they, can be, they cannot be 100% factually correct, it does not necessarily mean that they are a misrepresentation in the truest sense and you can have a claim. Let's look at a second one. Uh, this one is very interesting. Nivea lotion, Nivea body lotions. There is a guarantee there that it will give you protection for 48 hours. Now, if... Um, you buy Nivea. What the claim is, is that you are going to enjoy it for 48 hours. And for you to enjoy it for 48 hours, you are going to be expecting to receive maximum benefits from this particular lotion cream that you're using. So if you are going to enjoy it for 48 hours, in the truest sense to maximize the benefits of using Nivea, it means you're not going to wash it off for 48 hours. How practical is that? How practical is that? So practically speaking, every one of us would wash maybe three times in 48 hours. 
So if you're going to wash three times in 48 hours, surely you cannot be benefiting from the Nivea you applied 48 hours ago. So this might be something that will never be benefited by anyone or not tested by anyone. All of us were getting part benefits from using these lotions that have a 48 period, 48 hour period, because that 48 power, 48 hour period is um, a utopia. You will never get there. If you are going to push 48 hours without bathing, surely there's something wrong with you. Nivea is not for you. <laughs> Nivea is not for you. It's not for you. But um, bottom line, what are the things that are going to be considered as you are looking at um, your misrepresentation? There are four, 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 four issues that are key for us to determine that a misrepresentation has taken place and we must look for uh, restitution. Number one, the misrepresentation must have been made by the parties to the contract. Parties to the contract. When a third party makes a claim on the side, that is neither here nor there. Number two, um, it must be made prior to entry into the contract. So you cannot say there was a misrepresentation after you have already uh, entered the contract. Number three, this particular misrepresentation, besides it being made prior to the contract, it must be the cause for you to be under a material error as you go into this contract. You could have a situation where a misrepresentation is made, but it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with your information that you already hold at hand, what you already know about the product and what you already want from the, uh, from the enterprise. So um, give you an example. You, you, you get uh, to a situation where you are in a shop. This usually happens in the shop. You are there, you're buying something, and uh, there are these um, uh, shoppers that are with you who set, uh, suddenly turn into salespersons. And then they'll tell you, oh, you look, you look lovely, and there's no need to look good, and you pick it, pick it. And, and this is someone who's just passing. They are not employed to market the goods, but all of a sudden they become a marketing leader to you. If you buy based on their recommendation, you cannot come back and say there was a misrepresentation. Number three, you must also be under an error at the time you are entering into the contract. So you could have a situation where, um, let's say it's um, the spares that are being sold. An intern is there and uh, just blunders. But this intern is making a blunder to a mechanic, a seasoned mechanic, who is expected to know more and much better stuff about cars than uh, this um, intern. So when the mechanic makes that mistake, he cannot come back and claim that he was under a, um, he, he, there was misrepresentation because he was not under a material error. The error was not there. He's expected to know more and he even knows more. So prove that indeed you were misled resulting in your entry into this contract. And then above all, number four, there must be a causal link between the error and the reason for entering into the contract. Now a link is the connecting, whatever connects it. And it must cause it. So the misrepresentation must set the ball rolling for you to come to this error. So if there is no connection, the causal link, um, basically this is how it was explained to me in law school, but for, but for, uh, I, wish, I wish I had uh, I had something I could use as an example on me. Right, 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 right. This is just a pointer. The pointer is on the hand, right? It's on the hand. Now let's assume you're about to place this in my hand I remove my hand, this thing falls off. But for the remover, had this hand not been removed, this thing was going to land on my hand. So there is a causal link. My remover of the hand and the falling of this pointer becomes a causal link. Had I not removed the hand, this would not have fallen. Had I not been given the misrepresentation, I would have not entered the contract that is a causal link. I, I think I can explain it not better than that. <laughs> now, number two, we say there is error and then duress. When you look at error, there are three types of errors. 
The first error that we'll look at is error in expression. Error in, in expression is basically on account of what we think and what we write. Usually they are worlds apart. I'm sure most of you actually have all the answers correct, but the problem is an error of expression. You know the right answers, but when it comes to writing them, they come out as something else. That's an error of expression. It's an aside. I'm sure you would remember it. Now, in an error of exp expression, what happens is the parties want to enter into a contract. They have agreed on something, but what they have written is not what they wanted or what they have signed for is not what they agreed for. So what happens is where there's an error of expression, the contract will simply be rectified. So the rectification is where we want to make sure the contract reflects what was agreed. So what we do is when we sign, we sign for what we agreed. We sign for what we agreed. We do not agree for what we signed. I hope this makes sense. I'll take that again. Have you seen people who receive a contract, they sign it and then read it? That's not the proper sequence. You read it, understand it, then sign it. Every document, whether you're in the workplace, you read it first and then you sign it. You don't sign it and then read it. That's not the sequence. It doesn't work that way. So on rectification, what we do is we're trying to make sure the agreement is in tandem. Intravise. Remember it now. The agreement is in tandem with what is evidenced. So a written contract is not the contract. A written contract is the evidence of the contract. I hope it makes sense. A written contract is the evidence of the contract. What is the contract? The contract is consensus ad idem, a meeting of the minds, an agreement of the parties. If the parties agree, they have a meeting of the minds, we have a contract. How do we evidence it? We produce it here, it is in writing. So now to make sure that all these speak to the same thing, that's where rectification comes in. Now let's go to error of performance. This is the second type of an error. So the first one would not necessarily result in restitution in integrum. The, the contract will not fall away. We just rectify it, we move on. In B, you're going to find now an error of performance. An error of performance is um, basically saying the contract at the point of performance has not been performed correctly or has been for performed to the wrong person. The, the one to whom we are indebted, we have not given him or her the choose. We've given them to the wrong party. Now, when such a thing happens, this particular contract would not be considered to have come into existence. Now, where part of the money was due to A, but unfortunately we paid over and above what was due, this becomes an error in performance. Restitution in Intergram would then apply here. Now, there's a case, an interesting one, as of um, 2017, I think, it happened in Walter, Walter Sisulu, University of South Africa. A young lady uh, by the name Mani Sibongile was supposed to receive uh, 1,400 from the the grant institution, NAFTAs, I think. But uh, inadvertently, she was paid 14 million rands. So here is the issue. There is an error in performance in terms of the zeros. You see how zeros can make a big difference. Just a zero at the end of the number makes it way, way bigger than what it's supposed to be. For 14 million. I don't know what happened there in that office, but when the 14 million was uh, paid out, the newspapers, the tabloids, they, they report that she blew 60,000 of that. And um, it was then later discovered that the money was paid to the wrong person, over, overpaid. So when it was overpaid, there was now a need for Swangile to pay back the money. And she did pay back the money according to what the papers uh, claim. And the reason why she paid is basically because there was an error of performance. So even though the error was unilateral, it was on the other side, she still had to pay it back. And secondly, you're going to remember that when we looked at uh, capacity, on legal capacity, we said, should you have a situation where a minor does a misrepresentation and you enter into this contract, and uh, having entered into this contract, you find that the minor has blown the 60,000. 
if Spongile was a miner and she had blown the 60,000 on consumables, it would be difficult for NAFTAs. It would have been difficult for NAFTAs to recover from a miner. But I believe since she was college going, she must have been a major. So if she was a major, then she would have had an obligation to pay back all the money except the 1,400 that she was entitled to. I hope that makes sense. Now, there is also what is known as a consensual error. This is the third one. On the consensual error, this is where both parties are in error. They have a common mistake. So a common mistake that is consensual will take us back to the essential elements of the contract. There must be a meeting of the minds on the subject of the contract. If we miss it on the subject of the contract, the contract does not come into existence. Now, you could also have um, a unilateral error, which appears as if it's consensual, yet it's unilateral. Let me give an example. Here is a scenario where um, you walk over to um, a service point. You want to, let's say you are, um, you are by a filling station, a filling station. You want to pay, uh, get fuel for a hundred and um, um, let's say a hundred, uh, yeah, hundred dollars. That's a big tank, a hundred dollars. Now, as you're about to get fuel for a hundred dollars, what happens is as the, um, you pay the hundred dollars, you can pay uh, $90 loose, less $10 in error. The, ten, the, the, the attendant, the pump attendant is in a rush. There's so many queues. I mean, cars in the queue. Um, he doesn't count that money very well or she doesn't count that money very well. Pockets it and goes onto the pump where he is supposed to uh, pump in, I mean, punch in a hundred. When he gets to one, inadvertently punches one twice and a zero. That amount becomes 110. So notice this. You're going to get 110 worth of fuel for $90. So you made a mistake by paying $10 less. And the attendant made a mistake by giving you $10 more. Such that now you are getting $20 fuel. I hope you still go back and pay the balance. Now, in this kind of a setup, there is a consensual error, but it is not consensual. The fuel that has uh, gone out is not what was supposed to go out. The amount that has been paid into the, the organization is less. So we're having unilateral mistakes, not a consensual or a common one. There is no common agreement. It's the same effect but for the wrong reasons. So this is where now it becomes a unilateral mistake. So when you have a unilateral mistake, uh, what happens is it must not be self-induced. A unilateral mistake must um, um, come from one end. So when, when it is um, not self-induced, the course would look um, favorably on that. But if you bring it upon yourself, it'd be difficult for you to then want to wiggle out of a contract, especially when it is time to pay and you have enjoyed benefits from that contract. You cannot come back and claim a unilateral uh, mistake as a basis of wiggling out of it. Let's look at an example, maybe um, a more practical example. Not all of us drive cars as yet. Now, we have a situation where you walk over to the student finance office and uh, you're effecting a registration for this year. They tell you, okay, the terms and conditions are that if you don't have all the money, but of course we want everyone to have all the money, if you don't have all the money, pay 60% upfront, and then the balance, that will be your 40%, pay it before the end of the semester, before you take your exams, and you continue with your program. And uh, some students that are in this class, <laughs> um, they will not pay the 100%. They, they will still want to find ways of prolonging settling of the debt. To the point that when they come next semester, guess what? In the following year, they now want to pay 60% again. So they're out there, they're on the internet or they are in, uh, in the banking hall. They affect another 60%. And it is clearly marked. We are 
in uh, May, this is the first semester now you want to pay for the second session. It's September. You get there now, you clearly mark, this is my fees for the second semester. Or this is graduation application fees, 100 United States dollars. You clearly mark it. But you have a balance from last semester, which you have not paid. The fact that you have designated this amount as graduation fees or you've designated it as fees for the second semester, when it goes in, guess what it does? It services this standing debt. How does it service the standing debt? It is on the understanding that you must have taken a unilateral mistake. You are making a mistake on your own to write second semester or to write graduation when you know you're owing from last semester. So when that fees goes into the students uh, into the student portal into your account, it will service the previous fee. So your misguided understanding of your owings does not do anything towards the changing the contractual obligations you have. They continue to subsist. So when you get there, then you find that your balance is way lower than you anticipated. It does not mean the university has taken your money. It simply means you were operating on a unilateral mistake, which was self-induced. So you cannot come back and claim and say, the university took my money. No, you, you took yourself into this corner and locked yourself in there and got lost on your own. The university cannot be party to that. The university is going to implement the contract as is. And you service the earlier Jews that are owing. Now let's go on to duress. Uh, bear with me, we're almost at the end. On duress, this one you're going to find to be even more interesting. Duress basically has to do with um, where one's consent. Remember on uh, fraud and misrepresentation, someone is playing with your mind. They're playing with your mind. But with duress, it is either physical. You could have a situation where people are, um, are tortured. That is duress. So when, where, where there is torture, someone will be tortured into accepting a, a certain proposition. That is duress. Harm is inflicted. Pain is inflicted so that someone can then um, do a certain thing. You would have uh, situations also where a threat of uh, pain would uh, harm a threat of violence could be used as a way of um, securing a contract. So what Juris does is that in as much as fraud and misrepresentation taint the contract, it also taints the contract. So this Juris may, if it is at the formation stage, the contract becomes void up in issue. If it arises at a later stage, the contract is going to be invalidated from that point going forward. So where um, duress is um, torture, it's physical, it's clear. A contract will not start where there's any physical force. But you could have duress where there's a threat. And some of these threats that would uh, come up, they, 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 they may become so broad. So there's a need for them to be constricted. There are certain assumptions that the court operates under. I think you still remember the assumptions in terms of... Um, Legal, uh, the sanctity of contract, the assumptions that uh, those who go into commercial arrangements, they are going to be held responsible. The court is going to intervene. Social and gay arrangements, the court is not going to intervene. When we come to threat, the court also assumes that you are going to be moved, motivated to act when the threat is closer to skin. <laughs> it must be for those who are next of kin, your immediate family. Those are the people that when they are threatened, your, your decision-making may be affected somehow. I'm not saying we should not care any less about other people, but for somebody you have not met, if you heard that there is a threat that that person could be, could uh, have some harm before them because of your non-action, um, you, you should have really a, a good heart for you to be moved for every person that you have not met. That is where we should be as Christians. But most of us have not yet arrived. So the court says, no, not, of us is, no, not all of us are as, are as righteous as Christ. So some of us are not going to be immediately moved in that direction. So should you find that the threat is not your immediate environment? Uh oh, sorry. We will not consider that one. So as far as duress is concerned, it has to be physical or it can be a threat. And it must be to somebody who is 
close to you. And the, the nature of these threats would not be any threat. Um, we refer to the case of uh, Shalom Chiswa versus car rentals. And the brother, Bernard, is the one who took the loan. I mean, who hired the car and um, ran it for about 13,000 USD. Now, what car rental did, actually, is that they threatened to take legal action against Bernard for having run the bill. Shylon, having heard that her brother was in danger of prosecution, that is how she was then driven to accept the, the dirt and take it upon herself, which she later withdrew from. So this particular threat, in as much as it could have led to institutionalization of Bernard in a psychiatric center or something like that, that threat would not come under the ambit of duress because it is a legal threat. Because if the court were to allow people to circumvent the process, then it might find itself undoing uh, its gains. People must be seen to find more confidence in the legal process. So when someone is told legal proceedings are going to be taken against you and uh, the court is going to help you to avoid legal proceedings, then there's a problem there. So this particular threat was not a valid threat. So it, let's assume that Bernard was um, of sound mind. Shalon had uh, taken up the, the, the debt. The fact that she could not uh, pay it or for whatever reason she decided to recant and rescind that, the, 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 that obligation, that would not have what? Have stood. So in, in this case, she, she would have been compelled to... To, 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 to fulfill the, 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 the contractual um, uh, obligation that would have arisen out of that. So this, this is what basically it, uh, it comes down to. So one has to look at um, these kinds of threats and say, even though there may be threats that, um, that would not affect the immediate family, there are some threats that we could call economic duress. Economic duress is where you are sanctioned, you are sidelined. Um, well, because of the freedom of contract, the, 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 the law does not always jump in to defend contracting parties there because of freedom of uh, contract. But this is where now the uh, legislature will come in and regulate operations in that sense. Now, you could have a situation where you'd have someone... Um, having a threat of victimization, um, some of these threats would be do this or else you are fired. Uh, you'd have requests from your boss. Um, these kind of requests compel you to consent when you would not have consented. So this kind of duress, this kind of uh, mental torture, mental gymnastics, that's what we call undue influence. So it is someone who's using their position to lean on you and exert a consent which would not ordinarily have been given. So every time when there is that imbalance, this is where now you'd say, mm, this was not contractual. Or a, a quid pro quo. A quid pro quo is the one where you simply say, do this for me and I'll do this for you. So a quid pro quo would result in um, a tainted consent. So where someone would say, well, if I don't do it, I might not get it. So there is no longer free will. There is no longer consent with choice. So in a nutshell, um, abuse, duress, and undue, undue influence, all these will render a contract void. They will vitiate it. It ceases to be a contract. Why? Because someone has tempered with the consent. So in a nutshell, what we need to do is to ensure that at all times we have untainted, untainted consent with choice. Untainted consent with choice. Now, next, uh, we're going to be looking at the sanctity of contract. Um, and then thereafter, we're going to look at, uh, I think it will be the freedom of contract. Let's uh, look at uh, these uh, later on. But in the meantime... May the good Lord be with you and remember, two cannot walk together unless they have agreed. Take time to walk into a relationship and continue to walk with the Lord side by side. Blessings and peace. Good day.